Let's not sweat the small stuff, but paint it instead. And the one page rules jackals, well, they have a lot of small stuff. This jackal tracker has tiny claws, tiny belts and buckles, tiny bullets, tiny cords, tiny eyes, tiny everything. So this video is about taking a close look at the small stuff. First, I want to go over what makes a good brush for fine details. But if you don't care, head to this timecode to get to the painting. There's a prevailing idea that any model can be painted expertly with only two brushes, a number two and a zero brush. And I actually fully agree with that sentiment, though a case could be made for larger brushes, because I sure as heck ain't painting a behemoth with just a two. But there is another problem with this ideology. This is a size two brush. This is also a size two brush. This one is a size two brush. This one also a size 2 brush. This thin and long little thing? You guessed it, size 2 as well. There's no standard bristle size when it comes to the length of it and the belly. Most of the time they're only a size 2 in relation to the rest of the brushes in that set, but not when paired against others. So if I were to say you want a size 0 brush for fine detail, that means absolutely nothing. So how do we go about finding the right brush? The best size for a fine detail brush, in my opinion, is one that holds a point effortlessly and no smaller. So on these number twos, most of them can get to a really nice fine point, but we have to shape it that way, rolling it on the palette or wicking it on a paper towel. That's putting in effort to get our point. Effortless point brushes are a pretty easy metric to gauge. The less bristles it has, the more likely it just remains at a point. But the inverse is that it also holds less paint. So something like this zero is a short bristle with a decently wide base, so it keeps its point and also holds paint. While something like this double zero from Green Stuff World will absolutely hold to a point with zero effort. It's quite thin though, so will require going back to the palette more. So the perfect detail brush is something that holds the point effortlessly, but is a good size for holding paint too. My gold standard for the perfect detail brush is this one, the Raphael 8408. Not 8404, which is widely suggested by others, but the 8408. However, these are almost impossible to get, so I'm really just showing off. But my silver medal winner is the aptly named Green Stuff World Silver. They have a gold version too, but either way, a size one or zero will hold just the right amount of paint and keep a point effortlessly. For a synthetic option, I was given some of these Joe Sanja Sure Touch Select Round brushes to try out. And as someone who wants to like synthetics, one of the things you have to get used to is that bristles curl at the tip. And even though these have that, it's so minimal that it doesn't affect my painting at all. So I've been having a lot of good sessions with these, and for about five to six US dollars, they're cheap, guaranteed cruelty free, and still really good quality. There's also a medium I think that will really help us here, and that is a drying inhibitor. When it comes to really small stuff, there might not be a lot of paint or moisture in the paintbrush, so you don't get a very long working time with it. A drying inhibitor will give more of that drying time. Check out my video on mediums to get a little more in-depth look at what can be used for this. But I won't be mixing it directly into the paint. Since I'm using the wet palette still for mixes, were I to mix this into the paint, it'll make it too dilute by pulling out too much water from the sponge. So I'll be using it tactically instead, grabbing a weld palette and putting some in. I'll soak my brush and wick it away on a tissue like I would if it was just water, then use the tip of the medium filled brush to pick up some paint with it, and wick it away again. This should extend the drying time of this brush full of paint. This will have to be done each time of course, but small details rarely take too many brushfuls. One of the key factors to making small details stand out is contrast, and we get that by giving those details an outline. There's two schools of thought to this though. Do it after, which is a lot of work. 
or do it before, which is also a lot of work, but makes the rest of the process much simpler. And depending on how neat you paint, a lot of it can be done for you if you prime with a color that we can match with the rebasing. In the case of my jackals, I've been priming all of them with a red oxide and black primer mix. So the same mix will be used for my rebase. Purpose number one of the rebase is to pick out all the small details. So belt buckles, small belts, bones, ties, twine, cords, bags, connectors, teeth, tongues, little bits of metal. Claws too, though in this case I'm doing the claws in a different color, using some added green. Anything that isn't already defined by the other colors. This will give us an overall idea of all the things we need to get some color onto before the model is finished. Purpose number two is to give those small bits outlines. So like the pipes on his chest piece here, they divot into the armor a bit. So fill that divot with some of this rebase. When we paint the pipe itself, we'll leave that divot this dark color, and it'll provide separation between the two parts. Purpose number three for doing this is to give a dark start to work from. That's the reason I'm going with a dark color instead of a light one. Because for tiny details like all these belts and buckles, I find it immensely easier to go from a dark to a light. Because washes don't really work on tiny parts like this, so it's difficult to go from a light to a dark. Though, that is another good way to get the lining. While the last step was quite detailed, it had built-in forgiveness in that we were fine painting outside the lines. That was the goal. Not this time. So we have to make sure we've really got our hand steady. I find the best practice to reduce minor jitters is just to make sure my wrists are locked to the desk. Or with a wide desk, this is the one place where it's okay to put the elbows on the table. The idea being that we want to limit any up and down movement that might happen by leaving your hand free floating. I had a fun discussion lately that it's actually really hard to keep a model in frame and in focus. So that inspired me to see if I could kit together something to help. And I have this tiny tripod I thought might work. So base my model on some wood, I drilled a hole in and locked it in place. But I still find I wanna hold on to the model, not because it's moving, but for my other hand's sake. With the painting hand, I also always find it more stable when it's touching my holding hand. So even though it's locked in place and not moving, it's still worth it to hold the model. Anyway, on to the painting. The reason for all this steadiness is because I wanna block in all the colors of all the little parts, but make sure that I leave the edges of the dark red oxide I rebased them all in. For something like the armor pipes, quite simple. Since it's round, I just cover the top edge and it fills it in perfectly for me. For things like straps and buckles where they connect to other pieces is where we wanna be leaving that dark edge line while filling in the rest. If it's a large enough small detail, it might also be worth adding some texture to it with additional layers like the bags. A neat trick for little details like these is to actually use the surface tension of the paint. You can see on my brush point here that it's actually beaded up a little bit. That will get me the volume of paint I need and by touching it to the raised edge of a small detail, it'll stick to the surface, and I just have to spread it out using the tip of the bristles. The surface tension should make it so that it doesn't sink into the edges where we want that dark outline. If you're new to painting and you've managed to get these layers inside the lines, then absolutely feel free to stop here while you're ahead. Just getting a solid coat on some of these tiny details can be one of the hardest things to do, and if you can get to here, I'm already proud of you. If you're up for a bit of a challenge though, there's one more step to go. I've got three trains of thought when it comes to how to highlight the little bits. One simple, the other two a little more difficult. And it really depends on the piece sometimes too, but 99% of the time for tabletop painting, the simple method is the way to go. And that's just to dot the highlight in. Just getting a lighter color into the bristles and using the very tip to add little dots to corners of square things like bags, in the middle of round things like the claws, and in a line along cylinders with multiple edges. That little difference in color doesn't seem like much at first, but even from a distance, it can really sell the contrast of small parts in conjunction with the lining. 
To take that idea one step further is to just texture parts by adding multiple little dots in a line or even filling in a really sharp edge. For the belts and straps, I can use this method to add some wear to them. And for the bags, I can even further stretch out those points made last time for a more filled in edge. For the claws, some small lines will give the nail striations and a more natural look. Last thing is some competition level stuff, and that's to actually blend out these tiny parts. If they're a little bigger but still quite fine detail, it's still reasonable to do some wet blending. For the spines on his arms, I can blend out dark to light before adding the textures. And for the rope, with a thick white, I can actually do some loaded brush to give it a nice light gradient for some gentle highlights. Painting small can seem like a really impossible task, but I personally find it easier than painting some of the bigger things. With big stuff, you have to blend in texture, shade, and highlight, worry about light sources and contrast. With the small stuff, just a quick base and a poke of a color, and it's as marvelous as the rest of it. So don't fear the tiny, but practice it. And soon, all the small things won't seem so insurmountable. Please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this one, or just other fun things to do with painting miniatures. And until next time, enjoy your own painting journey.